The 540 is brought to you by StarCityGames.com's weekly sale. Head on over to StarCityGames.com slash sale because this week, Magic the Gathering played and heavily played foils are 15% off. That's right, 15% off for played and heavily played Magic foils from now until September 13th at 10.59 a.m. If you are looking to add a bunch of new foils to your commander deck or cube or modern deck, this is the time to do it. 15% off, that's more than you can get with Star City Games Premium, so definitely take advantage of this sale. Now until September 13th at 10.59 a.m., Head on over to StarCityGames.com slash sale. The 540 is also brought to you by Coalesce Apparel and Design. If you want to get the coolest magic t-shirts and hoodies and stickers, go to ColesseApparel.shop. And if you find something you like, use gift code SCG to save 10% off at checkout. That's ColesseApparel.shop. Nobody made what they wanted, so they made it themselves. What's up, everybody? Cedric Phillips here, stopping by real quick to let you know about one of Star City Games' newest podcasts, The Receivables, hosted by yours truly, alongside my partner in crime, of course, Patrick Sullivan, where the two of us discuss magic sets, both past and present, from top to bottom. On every episode of The Receivables, you're going to hear us talk about the facts of a set, the mechanics of a set, the cycles of a set, you know, the boring stuff, before we get into some crazy stories of when we were playing magic during the times that the set was legal. Uh, we've got a ridiculous award show where we give out awards like the Char Rumbler Award for Weirdest Card in a Set, the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for Best Card in the Set, and a whole bunch more. Before we finally decide, hey, what card won the set and what letter grade should we give the set? It's a whole lot of fun. We're having a blast recording them. Hopefully you have the opportunity to listen to it and you enjoy it as much as we're enjoying recording them. Where can you find it? StarCityGames.com or wherever else you listen to your podcast. The Receivables every single week here at SCG. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 540, where it is only appropriate, as we have the owner of the, uh, the most famous spooky cube in existence, that we're going to be heading to Innistrad for the next several weeks. So today, we're going to be talking about everything that we've seen, learned, and felt from the last five Innistrad sets as we approach Midnight Hunt coming out. I'm Justin Parnell. You can find me on Twitter at jparnell1, and of course, the aforementioned owner of the famous Spooky Cube. That would be me, Ryan Overturf. You can find me at Ryan Overdrive. It's September, which means it's practically October, which means it is spooky season, and I could not be more excited. Spooky season's good. It's a good season. It's a good season. Uh, even, even outside of the spookiness, just everything around the season, uh, but, you know, it mixes up with all, all of the spooky nature things, so. I'm I'm about it. Oh yeah, I'm 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 into the spooky spirit. <laughs> we have the Halloween decorations up in the apartment, so we we are ready to go. I'm really digging the previews from Midnight Hunt we've seen so far. We'll get into that more next week, though. I've been reminiscing a bit, preparing for today's episode, thinking about original Innistrad, and that's enough to get me excited by itself. Yeah, I think this is, uh, you know. Talking about Midnight Hunt a little bit, this is, we're, we're still, when we're recording this, we're still early into the preview season. So by the time that you listen to this, you're going to have known probably the vast majority of the set where we don't yet. Mm -hmm. So because of that, we're going to be coming back over the next few weeks, starting next week, uh, to go in depth like we do on all of the cubable cards in Innistrad Midnight Hunt. But like we said, uh, today is just going to be a journey down memory lane. Yeah, Which and could be lengthy because we have five of them, five <laughs> sets. <laughs> that is a funny uh, thing. There's, there's five Innistrad sets. So it's going to be original Innistrad, then you have Dark Ascension, and then Avacyn Restored, which was a standalone draft set at the time. So now sets come out one at a time. You draft them alone. Midnight Hunt and was it the Crimson Vow? What's the other? Yeah, Crimson Valor. Nice, right. nailed it. Uh, you're gonna; those are gonna have some compatibility in drafting. But back then, 
generally sets were three set blocks that you drafted them together as they came out. Innistrad and then Dark Ascension were drafted together. Avacyn Restored was a standalone. And then fast forward to the return to Innistrad, you had Shadows over Innistrad and Eldritch Moon, which were drafted together. And so you have a couple of blocks that are, are pretty different. Like those, the, the Innistrad one, it was our departure that Avacyn Restored was a standalone. And then Eldritch Moon Shadows were part of a block structure where blocks were two sets. And now we are currently in jumping from set to set standalone draft, except Innistrad is an exception as those two sets will be drafted together. So kind of an interesting mishmash there. Yeah. You know, they Wizards has constantly said, oh, we're just going to do one. And then there, here's an exception. Here's an exception. There's been like eight exceptions so far. <laughs> so it's just like whatever they want, which is fine. Which is fine. I'm totally fine with that. Uh, but it will be interesting to see something that is more purposeful design uh, with two sets that share cohesion. A lot, I guess a lot like Guild of Ravnica and Ravnica Allegiance was probably the last time that that happened to that degree since they've gone away from blocks. Mm-hmm. Blocks, air quotes around that. <laughs> And I got to say, this, the, there is an opportunity here. The bar for the set in Estrada is very high, but the bar for two in Estrada sets that you draft together, I think they can clear that. Um, yeah. Basically, every set other than in Estrada is a worse draft environment than in Estrada by like a wide margin. In Estrada into Dark Ascension, it got a lot worse drafting the two set block. Avison Restored, I actually blocked that set out of my memory. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sh- Shadows is a shadow of the former Innistrad. It's a perfectly fine limited environment, and there's actually a yeah. lot of really awesome cards, and in fact, really awesome cube cards. If you go over the set list, just doesn't quite live up to the expectations I had at the time as compared to original Innistrad. Yeah, it's tough when you make one of the greatest sets of all time. I think probably at that time it was probably uh, the most the most popular, maybe the second most popular set. But I think probably the most popular set of all time at that time. And then you go back for the first time. I mean, what were you going to make the next most popular set of all time? <laughs> it, it's I mean, tough. that's tough. It's that's a tough bar to clear. Yeah, Innistrad is a really cool history because it was a flavor first design. It was top down. They invented a world of gothic horror and then made mechanics to fit it. Richard Garfield came in and worked on the set and the mechanics were just incredible. The way that that draft environment worked, just so many of the cards in every pack were live, which is actually probably more true of a number of recent sets. But at the time, that was incredibly groundbreaking. And there's just all these really cool world building things that happen to be attached to playable cards. The draft environment had a pretty radical evolution. I remember watching a draft deck tech with SEG's Jerry Thompson. And it, when the set first came out, the, the go-to immediate deck, the level one deck for draft was travel preparations, aggressive decks. Uh, yeah. You don't know that card. It's green and one for a sorcery with flashback white and one. Put a plus one plus one counter on up to two target creatures. So you just curve out, cast that to make your stuff larger than your opponents. Pretty big swing with those being a permanent buff with the plus one plus one counters. And then the the deck tech, I just remember watching this, Jerry Thompson explaining how you draft around spider spawning, which was a totally different kind of archetype, a self-mill deck. You're trying to put cards from your own deck into your graveyard to get enough creatures. So that your five mana sorcery makes more one, two spiders. And then it has flashbacks. So that also synergizes with self mill. And then the draft format was just never the same. And so going from like having this really powerful aggressive deck to this really cool, almost combo-y synergy deck. And then finding the drafts where you're still supposed to draft the travel preparations deck. A few sideways graveyard archetypes, of course. Uh, Invisible Stalker, Butcher's Cleaver being a big part of limited format. There was just so much cool stuff going on, just unique angles to draft the format. And man, I'm I'm just gushing over it, just thinking about it. Yeah, I think, you know, when you go talking back and listening to you talk about it, those are the type of things that really that really grab people to love limited is formats like that. And honestly, I, I, I honestly believe that 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 is often an analogy to people becoming uh, 
cube owners. Yeah. Because a lot of times you're just like, oh my gosh, I had this awesome experience. I want to constantly recreate this. And we'll talk about, you know, Innistrad specific cubes a little bit later, but just in general, like that, you know, I think some most of my favorite moments in magic, just, just as a magic player in my lifetime have been having this limited deck that I just absolutely am in love with. And I'm just like, I would play this deck a hundred times, but generally you play it like three times and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. And then there's this hunger to try to put something together that's similar or in a great draft environment, like Innistrad, you have all of these different options uh, that are available to you. And that is, that is what a, a great cube feels like is, is a set that's put together like that, where you're chasing this awesome thing constantly. And people feel like they're like, oh, all right, well, Innistrad's going to be moving on. And now Avacyn restores out. I don't like this format as much. What can I do? Well, I'll just make my own Innistrad set so I can keep drafting that. Yeah, and Innistrad. And that's how a lot of people transition. Yeah, beyond individual decks, the design of Innistrad was hugely in uh, influential for how I approach drafting cubes and what I like in cubes. I was talking about the spider spawning deck, another big deck from Innistrad Limited was building around Burning Vengeance, another kind of signpost on common. Uh, that one dealt two damage to any target when you cast a spell from your graveyard. And so also has some self-mill applications with flashback spells and just setting up from the draft where sometimes you open those cards, you can move in on them. If you don't open them, drafting in a way that either tries to force them or leaves yourself open to going into one or if your draft was really crazy, both of those strategies, um, that's just the stuff like the overlapping kind of sideways, cool archetypes. I, I love trying to see that kind of stuff in my own cubes. Yeah, I think that Innistrad was very much ahead of its time from a, uh, a limited environment. I think pretty much, I feel comfortable saying from like Dominaria forward, we've gotten really consistently good limited environments. Um, and I think people take that for granted a lot. Like there's not many that I would say are just unfun or don't have don't have depth. And I'm not saying all of them are, you know, as interesting and developed as something like Triple Innistrad is. But at the I guess the point that I'm trying to make is at the time that set stood out way more than it would now because a lot of the design sensibilities from there are applied to basically all of the limited environments that you have seen for the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just hugely influential. And it is particularly cool to me, just the fact that it was this top-down design. There's just so much stuff that's dripping with flavor. It's a Shadows over Innistrad card, but the card that always comes to mind when I think of the plane of Innistrad is Shard of Broken Glass, just just the cards pulling you into this desperate world of horror where you have to improvise weapons to fight monsters. And then on top of that, the set in just world being such a mechanical hit as well. Yeah. And that's, and, the, and the, I mean, that's really one of the most notable things is like you said, this was designed from an aesthetic point of view, first and foremost. And then they figured out what the cards did. And basically got most everything right. Mm -hmm. And even if they didn't reach the heights of Innistrad previously with any of the four follow-up sets, Dark Ascension, Avacyn Restored, Shadows Over Innistrad, Eldritch Moon, it's again because you're trying to topple the giant and it's going to be really difficult to do that. But I think a lot of those sets get a bad rap because they're only looked at from a comparison standpoint. Mm -hmm. And as a cube owner, I know that there are a ton of great cube cards in literally all of those sets. Like across the board. Yes. Uh, more than more than the average set. Even you know, Avacyn Restore. Like, even Avacyn. Well, I mean, Avacyn Restore, especially. Honestly, yeah, there's, there's way more hits than I would have thought off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a. Uh, it's 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 rough because again like people look at it from a comparative point of view and they remember Innistrad and this massive impact which it absolutely has and i it's you know it's one of the greatest sets of all time for magic and for cube 
you know, which is obviously what, you know, what we're, we're trying to look at for this podcast, but, uh, there are, uh, there's a lot of bangers hidden in, in the rest of the four, uh, lesser in Estrade sets. So <laughs> I am, uh, I'm looking forward to, I guess, diving into those more thoroughly and next few weeks when we get into midnight hunt, because I don't want to say this is like a return to form, but this looks and feels more like the original Innistrad than it does any of the other previous sets. Yeah. After that. Yeah. Something about shadows over Innistrad is I completely agree. There's a lot of individual cards that are just awesome. were great and constructed have make significant contr- contributions to classic and custom cubes alike. A lot of great individual cards and Innistrad might not even hold up to these sets overall if you're talking about individual cards, but in terms of the world building and how exciting and how it like felt you were part of the world with Shadows, the set just did not compare in that way. The limited environment was a little less deep, so there was a lot more individual cards maybe that jump off of the file and into your cube, but the draft experience was, was less immersive. But when I look at the previews for Midnight Hunt, it feels like they're really going for those original Innistrad vibes. And uh, yeah. I don't draft a lot these days. I drafted a lot of Zendikar Rising because I thought Party was a very good mechanic. And like, I didn't like learn the, the format. Like, I didn't draft. I just forced cards with Party creature types because that was <laughs> a fun mechanic. And Arena <laughs> yeah. Currency is not worth anything. So that was like a fun thing to do. So your, your, your limited environment has to be fun. I don't, don't care about being good at limited. That's just not my thing anymore. Uh, but sure. this set looks like it's fun. It does. It does. Uh, and I will, I mean, I will say as someone who does draft uh, a lot, you know, I, I say the, ma- the majority of my time spent on arena, like in my personal time, especially now that I'm not streaming is, is essentially playing some form of limited. And uh, whenever I have a chance to do so in person, I, I do that. I've, I, I, I would say I have, more so a limited player than a constructed player. And the only reason I've played so much constructed is the lack of availability of limited because you often need more than one other person. <laughs> Hence, uh, and this is a good, this is a good uh, trigger for Ryan to say the word Tubert. So we'll just say that he did and I'm just going to keep going on. Perfect. Uh, um, do you have, what? well, I was going to say, I guess you do have, what would you say is your favorite Innistrad set other than original Innistrad. So if you're picking from the other four, what is your next favorite? I think that I have to give it to Eldritch Moon. Mm -hmm. I love Delirium as a cube mechanic. We'll come back and talk about that more when we go over the set more in depth mechanically in the second section. But that was sort of the thing where they really leaned in in cool ways in the second set. Eldritch Moon also was a smaller set than Shadows of Innistrad, so there's more concentrated goodness in Eldritch Moon. And while none of the other sets hold up in terms of draft, I will give it to Eldritch Moon. And I will say, I drafted Avacyn Restored exactly once. I, <laughs> in fact, it was two drafts. I entered a draft open after um, okay. I, either a min cash or dead last finish at an invitational weekend. And I split the finals with Dave Shields. It was like, Dave Shields, uh, Cobb, Grand Prix Cobbley champion, Dave Shields. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you, you'd know the name. Um, so <laughs> oh, like, I'm familiar. I'm up like 500 bucks lifetime on Avacyn Restored Limited, and I still think it's fucking horrible. <laughs> what did you draft? Do you remember? In the first draft, blue was open, so I had like a deck with like three Mist Ravens or something outrageous. Sure, yeah, so it didn't uh, just matter. Actual mono blue. Yep. And then my top eight deck was horrendous. I know one of... I th- I think it was black, white. I know I was white and I don't really know. I feel like this can't be a particularly good card in the set broadly, but I want to say the most significant card in the matches I played in one was a five mana aura that like gives you a one, one token every turn. I don't even know yes. if it has other text. Uh, um, yes. Uh, I literally <laughs> cannot remember the name of the card. Uh, Whew, yeah, so, I mean, Mist Raven is is completely ridiculous. Uh, it's either I mean, it's probably the it was probably the best common in that set in, in a vacuum. Uh, there were cards that could have been other co- co- commons that could have been better. Archetype wise, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, like, I, yeah, I don't think my deck like so, did anything mechanically interesting. It wasn't really an archetype. It's just I can't, I curved Mistraven into Griff Vanguard, and yeah. people lost because the tempo and card yeah. advantage on yeah, evasive yeah, you played a two threats. two and yeah. then you played a like a three power flyer. But uh, uh, I think you're talking about Commander's Authority. This is uh, they're just at the beginning of uh, your upkeep. You make a one one human. Yeah, and this is an aura. Yes. You enchanted yeah, an a creature with this for some reason. A creature. I yes. remember I was pretty belligerent just uh, in my life at the time. And at, I, at that event, I sharpied the word bitter blossom uh, over uh, a chunk of that card. But the advantage that I had and the reason I got the split from Dave is I finished all of my matches before him. And mm-hmm. his deck was good. Yes. And he had Sorry. good rares, and we ended up playing it out for the plaque. I think it was a plaque was the uh, trophy esque thing for that event, and he just like cast Tamio the Moon Sage, and I just, <laughs> games were just never competitive. Um, but I, I appreciate the split anyway. Yeah, uh, it was a. It's a. I didn't hate that format as much as most people did, but. I will say that I did not draft very many things, and the two things that I drafted were generally pretty good, and I was able to to draft them pretty regularly. And the reason I think the reason that I was able to that I drafted Evson Restored a lot is I was telling you before we started recording, I was changing jobs and I moved to a, a completely different city, uh, like right as Instrad was coming out, like a little bit before. And Innistrad through Dark Ascension uh, was like the time that I was like getting settled in and I had like an hour commute to work and I hadn't like established like a local game store. So I just didn't I just didn't play magic very much other than like building basically other than like building my cube uh, for like a five month span. And that was Innistrad to, to Dark Ascension as it turned out. But then when I finally did. It was on the tail end of that, and then Avacyn Restored came out, and then I was like, I'm going to draft like five times a week. <laughs> uh, so I drafted Avacyn Restored probably a bunch, probably like 20 times, I would imagine. Sounds like more than any other human. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, uh, I forced, speaking of humans, that is generally what I forced in the draft. A little Thatcher uh, Revolt strategy? A little, Yeah, a little Thatcher Revolt. I mean, I had a deck with like two, the most, the most ridiculous deck I had. Uh, it was like two Vigilante Justice, two Keswick Malcontents, like a, just a fistful of Thatcher Revolts and Riot Ringleaders. And it was just Vigilante Justice was barely good in the deck because it cost four mana and the game barely lasted that long. <laughs> but if I ever landed it, then it didn't last and the, the game was over the next turn. <laughs> uh, I drafted that. I drafted that a lot as people were like dumping around playing these slow decks. I'm just like, I'm just going to punch you. In the mountain, mm-hmm. these fast humans. I remember that being a deck I had heard about at the time that I played the draft open, and some of those yeah. cards were floating in the packs. And it's one of those archetypes that's kind of reliant on getting a high volume of a bunch of quote unquote bad cards, and then there's yes. synergies among them. Yeah. And there was one or two players I recognized at my table, but I was low confidence in my ability to wheel a bad card to the table <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> But luckily, I wield a lot of good cards like Mist Raven and Griff Vanguard. Yeah, yeah. Well, you should never wield Mist Raven, or you should barely never see Mist Raven. Yeah, you open and it's kind of remarkable. It probably probably set the record for Mist Ravens in the same draft deck. Uh, three is an astronomical number. <laughs> it's just it's just obnoxiously high. The other deck that I drafted is was the Mono Black Homicidal Seclusion. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with this card? Uh, I am because that's what David McDarby was playing when I beat him in the top four of that draft open. I uh, assume he mulliganed to like two or something because, again, my deck was very bad. But that is uh, where I know that card from. Yeah, Homicidal Sleep, it's an enchantment for five. It says as long as you have exactly one creature, that creature gets plus three, plus one in lifelink. Um, so you just you basically are just playing like this mid range control deck that you're killing everything and you have like eight creatures in your deck uh, and you just play them out one by one and then you wait till they kill that one by trading or otherwise you gain a bunch of life then you play another creature uh, 
And it is definitely possible to have multiple homicidal seclusions. Then you just build this gigantic life linking monster every single time. So mm-hmm. that deck's pretty sweet. However, uh, both of those decks certainly have a fail rate. Yeah, you know where I might have got him? There's like a card that's worse than passive. Well, where you might have got him is you had three fucking Mist Ravens, Ryan. That was so no, no, my top eight draft did be... not. My top eight draft was the okay. bad one. <laughs> I was about uh, to say. And my I was top like, eight well, there, Mist Raven. Yeah, no, my Mist Raven deck would have clowned anybody. But um, <laughs> there's, there's an aura. I think the word Fang is in the name. And it's like, it's not fully pacifism. It just says the creature can't attack. Uh, Defang. Uh, one yes, and a white yeah. enchant creature prevent all damage that will be dealt by enchanted creature. I think yeah. that my horrible deck was playing a couple three of those. Um, <laughs> I mean, that card's looks... real good against the seclusion. Yeah, yeah, uh, it it is, it is. So uh, yeah, look, Avatar Short not great. <laughs> um, it's not great. I'm not going to defend it anymore. I will uh, to go back to my original question. Uh, my number two Innistrad set with a bullet is absolutely Eldritch Moon. I agree with. You. Mm. Actually, I actually think that that's a really, really great set. Um, and I think that it it's crazy because you drafted that alongside Shadows over Innistrad. And the sets are, are kind of pretty different. Um, and they did not have a lot of like crossover mechanics between them. There were like these loose strings of like, oh, let's put cards in your discard pile for flashback. Let's also put cards in your discard pile for delirium. Uh, but the sets were like, again, they were they were fairly different. So I think that they hurt. I think independently, had they been developed a little bit more. With being a similar set that that continued on the themes rather than like abandoning them and like switching themes in either direction i think it would have been a lot better draft environment but as it stood you're kind of just sometimes stuff didn't work out because of the 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 relative disjointed nature uh fortunately one of the biggest mistakes i think of that entire block is being rectified midnight hunt which is the removal of investigate from eldritch moon that uh, mechanic, which was, in my opinion, the best one from Shadows of Innistrad, did not make it into Eldritch Moon, but uh, it, it is going to be in Midnight Hunt, which I'm very excited about. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they will repeat their mistake and also not have it in Crimson Vale. And then we'll, <laughs> you know, maybe then you can draft uh, Midnight Hunt alongside Shadows of Innistrad and then uh, Crimson Vale alongside Eldritch Moon. <laughs> <laughs> the two ways to draft Innistrad yeah, are exactly. triple Innistrad or all the other set chaos draft. Yes, that is exactly right. Oh, man. Uh, So I guess before we, you know, I do want to talk about, uh, you know, more about, you know, Innistrad as a isolated theme within Cube. So I guess before we get to that, any anything else, just any random thoughts just on the the impact of this set for magic or for Cube? Um. I mean, I, looking, looking at the file, there's, there's some cards that age well. I think that on an individual card basis, Innistrad did not age on the whole in a super compelling way. But if you really want to look at the set for inspiration, I think that you have to really try to understand the, the experience, the entire experience of it, and how the cards relate to themselves, which is a little bit difficult to do retroactively. And I think we're going to be talking a lot more about individual cards when we get to mechanics. But the the groundbreaking thing and what I said earlier about Innistrad has really motivated me the way that the archetypes really overlap and how deep the packs were, which is a big part of what I like about Limited. When I like Limited set, those things tend to be true and really inspirational and influential on how I design my cubes. Awesome. I I think that's a great takeaway point and probably a good point to end on for this segment. So. We are going to take a short ad break and we're going to come back and talk more specifically about Cube as it relates to Innistrad in just a moment. Listen up, gamers. I have some huge news. If you haven't heard, the SCG Tour Online is back and we're giving away cash prizes, tens of thousands of MTG Arena gems, 
MTG Arena Qualifier Weekend Invitations, MTG Arena Championship Invitations, and the big one, Star City Games Invitational Invitations. You heard that right, the Invitational is back. And that's gonna be at SCGCon. SCGCon is back, taking place Halloween weekend, that's October 29th through the 31st, in the Star City, that's Roanoke, Virginia. And you can qualify for the Star City Games Invitational via the SCG Tour online. Stay tuned for more details on that. Those will be coming soon. And for more information on the SCG Tour Online, head over to scgtouronline.starcitygames.com. Now back to the pod. All right, Ryan. So this is probably the time where we just go ahead and lead right in to your Spooky Cube and how how you have, have taken what you have loved about Innistrad as a setting and turned this into a cube environment. So. We've talked about graveyard cubes a few times on the podcast, and I always make the point because it is just a fact that White's pretty bad at graveyard stuff, that it's totally reasonable to do a four-color graveyard cube, and if you don't, you probably have to figure something else out with White. Mm -hmm. And if you go with the spooky setting, the kind of horror world building, the stuff that the Plane of Innistrad offers, the world of Innistrad is very much humans versus the monsters. And you're supposed to approach this, and I would imagine that most people do because you are a human, empathizing with the humans and <laughs> thinking that there's something likable or relatable. You know, you're supposed to be on their side, at least on some level. And there's a lot of great cards for a human tribal there. And so while you don't get a ton of good graveyard stuff, there are a few standouts for white um it's not an innistrad card but the coolest white card in spooky cube was rally the ancestors but anyway that did cue off a lot of human tribal things and innistrad delivered on both of these fronts it both gave you graveyard things and the appropriate graveyard colors and then a resonant element of world building and mechanical thing to do with the non-graveyard color giving you humans and that also bleeds into the other colors which makes for some pretty adaptable and sideways archetype drafting even with the tribal uh mechanics there yeah and that's what i was actually gonna that's what i was gonna bring up next is you know one of the things that uh i think they kind of like backwards fell into when designing in initially was when they were developing this world they were like as it turns out we have these very distinct tribes so fleshing these out uh you know, is, is going to be a priority for us as a design team. And then, well, you know, the result of that is Innistrad essentially is now a, it's like a tribal plane. Mm -hmm. You know, every time we go there, there's a significant amount of tribal resonance. And there's been a lot of like tribal centric cards, not just for the major tribes that we've seen, those being spirits, vampires, werewolves, zombies, and humans. Uh, but just good tribal cards and more more teachings of how to kind of build a tribal set uh, to where you have cards that are bridging the gap that aren't just a specific tribe card, but go along uh, with more than one. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, you know, a lot of great cube teachings just in that set. And that's something that's continued through the rest of the Innistrad sets that I think people that are making tribal related cubes have taken a lot of uh, clues from whether or cues from rather <laughs> sorry i'm thinking about clues that was my next cues from whether they have realized it or not yeah and i think that the thing that innistrad does really well in terms of tribal for very casually minded players or or players that really just want you know the, the timmy tammies the, the the lords the lord of atlantis and the master of yeah. the pearl trident that stuff is a constructed deck. You can play it week in and week, week out. Um, some people are really gung-ho about that. It's way less compelling for Cube to just do the lore kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. there's a ton of designs that support tribal in ways where having a high volume of the creature type matters, but not just in terms of outsizing your opponent. Some great examples off the top of my head. Champion of the Parish and Crypt Breaker are really two standouts on this front because they care about the card type. They still kind of do enough as individual cards. You know, Champion 
if you don't play at least one other human, it's going to be a problem for you. But Crypt Breaker is still like a cool discard outlet. So they're just inherently playable cards in the tribes that also care about the tribal element somewhat. And they're also efficient. You need to have cheap stuff in your tribe there. So we're checking a lot of boxes there. Just generically playable stuff in tribes, especially if it cares about the tribe, is really what is going to make a tribal theme compelling to draft in a redraftable kind of way for a cube. I think your mention of Grave Breaker is Grave uh, Crypt Breaker. I was gonna I was gonna go to Grave Crawler next, but I think your mention of uh, Crypt Breaker is probably like the poster child for this sort of design. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that clearly cares about a specific tribe in zombies. But unlike Gravecrawler, you don't need to be specifically pushing a, a zombie tribal focus for that card to be a good card. It is simply better in that environment, so you're able to push it a little bit farther where you have narrower cards uh, and... Even something like Gravecrawler, which is a you know a two one that is slightly recursive when you have other zombies, is even though that might not be as narrow as a Lord of Atlantis or you know the your your creatures of this type get this bonus. Uh, it's it's providing the halfway point of this can fit into my deck if I'm drafting if I'm drafting a deck that wants a one drop or maybe wants some sort of card advantage uh, and, and creature advantage, but it doesn't have to be tribal focused. But if I am tribal focused, it's going to be even better. Mm -hmm. And there's some good stuff already previewed for Midnight Hunt. I'm excited to talk about this more in depth when we get to our set reviews for Midnight Hunt. Um, I, th I think that in the first two in Estrada blocks, they did spirits kind of dirty where the good spirits, it doesn't matter that they're spirits. Selfless spirit, you're just putting a beat down deck. These cards that care about spirits tend to be lords. So mm -hmm. the tribal element is not very compelling. There's a little bit going on in vampires. I'm actually really excited about some of the vampires already previewed where they're basically making it a bloodthirst kind of deck where if your opponent took damage, they do some added, added thing which is a lot something that a lot of vampires already mechanically do. I think that cards that play well with Stromkirk Noble, you know, the one mana one one for an Astral when it damages your opponent, you put plus one plus one counter on it. Mm -hmm. And just making it so these cards are just good and aggressive decks. Like it's just nice to play that on curve. And then they happen to be vampires and then you can get into some other vampire synergies if you decide you have a high enough volume. That's the kind of stuff that makes tribal really compelling in cube and zombies and humans are already there spirits i have not found them compelling as a tribe in my experience you basically have to overlap them with flyers but that's also just more anthems and evasion so it's not really materially different from just whatever generic beat down thing you want to do but it really looks like they're putting vampires and it also looks like they're putting werewolves over with midnight hunt i would hope so they're the uh you know they're the tribe on the packaging. Um, <laughs> yes. So for, but for Midnight Hunt, a card I want to I want to call out that is uh, that is also kind of specifically relevant to what we're talking about of of maybe not necessarily having cross tribe synergy, but more of utility beyond its creature type and caring about creature types is uh, Falconrath Pit Fighter. This is a two one. For a single red, it is a uh, vampire warrior. And there's no drawback. And the only text that it has is you can pay one in a red, discard a card, sacrifice a vampire to draw two cards. And again, it says activate only if an opponent lost life this turn. But this allows you to turn, you know, vampires, including itself, into card advantage in the late game. Mm -hmm. So while this card is totally fine on its own, and a lot of cubes, uh, the more that you go into the vampire setting and especially caring about like a more bloodthirst theme, then a card like this gets even better. Yeah. And this card is kind of compelling on its face, depending on your power level, because Jackal Pup is a card that used to show up in like every cube. Yeah, not just some cubes. Not like, even that long that ago. That card was really. like in every cube. And yeah. 
fire drinker Seder was like, whoa, it's better jackal pup, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and then this card also is really compelling to put in the same deck as your Falcon Wrath Gorger from Shadows Over in Estrad. One red for a 2 1. All your vampires gain madness. So you have multiple one mana 2 1s with no drawback, unlike some historical comparisons that have a relevant creature type and abilities that synergize along the lines of that creature type as well. Yeah, Ryan loves relevant creature type. Big fan. Yeah. Um, but even beyond, you know, like tribal synergies that you could have for Innistrad set cubes, there's a lot, there's a lot of tangential graveyard stuff going on. Uh, that I mean, you know, Ryan, you you were talking about like having a cube that could or that would exclude white from that largely. Um, but with the way that all of the Innistrad sets are set up, they all care about the graveyard in some way. So you could be putting together an Innistrad cube that you could have a lot of this like tangential graveyard stuff uh, that mimics what a lot of the Innistrad limited environments are like, where it's not about entirely about self mill but it those are those are large components that come into play again mm -hmm. something that's going to be continued in midnight hunt yeah and another way that creatures go to the graveyard is from the battlefield so you can yes. really support that in white with sacrifice themes that tends to be doomed traveler another hit oh. from originally in Estrad. yeah i love me a doomed traveler big fan of that guy uh so i think the last from a theme perspective so if you're making a cube, the last one, and this is probably the trickiest, and uh, this is kind of one where Midnight Hunt might not do you as many favors as it's looking like, but that is like focusing on a like transform cube. Have you ever encountered or seen or played a transform cube? Uh, seen, not encountered or played. It's the sort okay. of thing where when I'm really going deep and rifling through other people's posted cubes online or maybe some stuff I would have missed or some inspiration, I'll see somebody post a list of a cube that's heavy on werewolves and has moon mist, uh, which is a fog that, definitely that counts. lets that you... That definitely counts. <laughs> yeah, lets you transform your werewolves. And kind of the thing about that is you really have to scale back the power level to make moon mist compelling. Fog is just not that exciting in a cube that has a good clip of efficient removals or otherwise just creatures that can close really quickly. Just any high power level stuff. If there's a planeswalker in your cube, it's probably not a great environment for fog. And all the things yeah. that I say that make fog bad are things that I like. So <laughs> the the really pushing the werewolves in that way thing is not really my style. However, I do kind of like the flash, just play a deck that allows you to cast no spells on your turn, which will allow you to transform your werewolves because they care about either nobody playing a spell or somebody playing two spells. So some cheap stuff you can play at instant speed. There's been more and more one-offs on the way to Midnight Hunt since the last time we have been to Innistrad. Mm-hmm. And you can put that stuff together, and that is really good support for your werewolf deck. And that's where I find it the most compelling, though I am sure that there are some listeners that are bigger fans of Moon Mist than I. Yeah, a good example of this is uh, Nightpack Ambusher, which is uh, you know basically the culmination of the card that Ryan was describing. People, even though this is a wolf and it makes wolf, people will forget the Nightpack Ambusher's actual text says other wolves and werewolves you control get plus one, plus one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Flash right. Lord yeah. cares about uh, many of the same things. You know, it's trying to tell you not to play spells on your own turn. And yeah, a lot, lot to like about that if you're trying to support werewolves. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I certainly agree. I think werewolves, I think the initial way that they've, that they choose, chose to do the transform mechanic is it's, I mean, I kind of hate to say it. it's like, I actually think it's like a terrible limited mechanic. I think it, I think it succeeded in spite of its design. Um, 
because it is it's very punishing uh if you are trying to draft transform stuff your opponent has a lot of agency over that by simply playing the game i think it was really punishing for less experienced players which i think is the point you're trying to make where yes you just cast your one mana one one i forget the name of that card that card used to show up in a number of cubes uh i love the art on that card it's like uh, reckless waif oh that's a different one they're st- oh, yeah, I'm thinking of one from the next shadows. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This yeah, one was turned into a 3-2. Yeah, it turns into a 3-2. And yeah. a, the 3-2 is, is fine. If you get to the 3-2, you're doing pretty well. But if your opponent just plays spells from their hand, it's really bad that you have that card in, in your deck. Yeah, it's just a transform is a tough mechanic because you're like, all right, I'm going to take my turn off because my opponent's casting spells. I'm going to take my turn off to uh transform my my werewolves into their good side yeah you know, and, like, all right i'll do nothing and say go then and turn like I'll, I'll opt and just so i don't get into it with any limited pedants it's not like it was strictly incorrect to play reckless wave however i think you i think if you add access to the data more people were just getting smushed playing reckless wave than the people that were playing yeah. it correctly yeah and then on the opposite side you are playing the transform deck that relies on number of spells cast to transform and your opponent misses a land drop and they're like, oops, I was on the play and I played a werewolf, so I'm just going to destroy you now because now you can't possibly turn this back around. Yep. Yeah, that definitely uh, came up. Yeah, and it's just not great. And I think the way that they've, they're changing that with Midnight Hunt, with Daybound and Nightbound uh, is significantly better. It still like reads the same, but um, the fact that uh, so now it says daybound. If a player casts no spells during their own turn, it becomes night next turn, and then opposite uh, for nightbound and daybound. If they cast at least two spells, but it has to be on their own turn, mm-hmm. so you can't get sniped at the end of a turn uh, to do that. It doesn't take away the second part where if you miss a land drop, you just get absolutely walloped. Uh, and you probably can't come back from that, but you know, if your opponent's casting spells, you're missing land drops, you're probably losing anyway. So yeah, maybe it's just speeding up the process. I think that on your own turn thing is a huge upgrade in terms of design. There's a couple of weird things. I'm, I'm excited actually to see how it plays with creatures entering on the backside if it is nighttime. That, that's how that works, right? I'm because it's either night or day, and they maybe. go on whatever the corresponding side is. Uh, I'm gonna they say, all say if it's not day or night, it becomes day. I don't so, know. I think Maybe I need to do some homework. It, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I just I don't I don't know enough. Okay, honestly, all of the day and night cards just have a bucket of text. Well, on them. yeah, this is the this other thing I was gonna say about the mechanic. They all say I'll know next week when Ryan. day becomes night or when night, night becomes, becomes day, day because yeah. it was impossible to come up with one term. I actually think I figured out the problem is if they just said something like when the time shifts, you know, you come up with whatever cleaner language you like, then that would also happen when it goes from nothing to day the first time, and they are purposefully templated so that doesn't happen. Or yeah. around that in some way. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, I don't know the answer to the question, but I will know next week when we actually have to think about and talk about these cards. So yeah. I'm going to go with a strong <laughs> maybe. Who knows? Yeah, we'll shelve that for next week. Okay. Okay. So the other two mechanics that are really uh, kind of ubiquitous among all of the Innistrad sets is there are a lot of tokens, pretty much of almost every creature type, and there's a lot of counters. Uh, more so tokens than counters, but a lot of the really great cards of both of those have actually come from all of these block or from all of these sets this mm-hmm. large collective block uh and and those are definitely things that you can center around for your innistrad cube uh especially if you're doing something that cares about tokens a uh, commander all-star cathars crusade which is from uh ryan's forgotten set avison <laughs> That card is a massive, gigantic beating. Little slow in traditional cubes, but if you're again, if you're trying to do something combat oriented, 
where you're putting a lot of counters on things, it's a sweet one. Another one of my favorites is uh, Champion of Lampholt. I've played that card in my cube many years. It is, uh, it is, I would say, uh, difficult to have a good experience with that card for somebody. <laughs> you're either uh, you played you either played a one one for three, or uh, your opponent can't block any of your creatures and dies very quickly. Um, so it's not, it has not been, not been in my cube for several years now, but when Avacyn Restore came out, I put it in and it probably lasted for a solid, probably a solid four or five years. That's a card that comes up now and again when I'm working on a cube list and I remember it existing. And I think maybe that'd be nice. And then I, I think about it for any amount of time and think, no, <laughs> that would not be nice. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, it's no, there's no middle ground. There's no, there's no push and pull from a, uh, a, a gameplay perspective. It's have or have not. I'm that glad is. that uh, you brought up tokens as a central theme, though, because that, that wasn't one that immediately came to mind for me, but is actually kind of, it was a big deal at the time if you really followed the professional scene. But uh, in, in Block Constructed, Lingering Souls and Intangible Virtue were banned. You know, originally yes. tried Block Constructed. That, you know, some listeners might not even know what Block Constructed is. It used to, used to be a constructed <laughs> format where you could only play cards from one block. So they could, they would be, you can play Innistrad, El, uh, bleh, uh, Dark Ascension, that's the one, and Avacyn Restored. And these are the three sets for your constructed deck. And the enchantment that gives your tokens plus one plus one in Vigilance was, was banned. Yeah, because there were so many tokens. Yeah, I mean, there's a. I mean, that tokens is really like that's like the secret main theme of all the Innistrad sets. Like, there's a ton of tokens in all of the sets. Mm -hmm. I would say there's more tokens in the Innistrad sets than any other like collective sets from a single plane. I mean, if tokens, you're not counting like Dominaria. That's just also a great way to support tribal themes. Yeah, you know, making yes. human tokens that comes up stuff like Gather the Townsfolk. Han Weir Garrison making human tokens and pumping your Thalia's Lieutenant was something that was a pretty big deal in that standard environment with Shadows of Rainestraw. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a there's a there's a lot of tokens that seems like that's uh, that's probably going to be continuing on with the the Midnight Hunt. But like, even looking back, I mean, you have every set, every single Innistrad set to give you a bunch of zombies. You're going to get a bunch of humans. I don't think human tokens actually existed before the first Innistrad set. I think that's the first time they came out. Yeah, I believe that's uh, correct. Spirits and vampires. Wolves were the least, but they still existed. There weren't werewolf tokens, but there are wolf tokens. Mm -hmm. um, so that is like, honestly, if you were going and you're making like, I want to make a tokens cube just because you love uh, just having... You know, some people love having just a fistful of tokens and just putting them all on the battlefield. And that's something I can respect. You're probably going to have a really, really high amount of Innistrad cards. Probably more, like I said, I bet those, uh, those five sets will be more represented than sets from any other single plane in Magic. Yeah, definitely a ton going on. Spider spawning, of course, mm -hmm. making your one, two spider tokens. It's yeah, probably my so favorite does, uh, card. Ishkana. Mm hmm. So go on. Yeah, yeah. Ishkana. That, this is actually something that I wanted to make sure to talk about is Delirium. It's a mechanic that we got a couple heaters for. An Unholy Heater and Dragon's Rage yeah. Channeler in Modern Horizons 2. But these were already... I, this this uh, Delirium as a mechanic was something I already found pretty engaging drafting cube because it adds this element where card type matters in your draft and the more powerful Delirium cards, the card you mentioned, Ishkana Graph Widow, 5 mana, 3, 5, Spider with Reach. And if you have Delirium, you get 3, 1, 2 Spider tokens with Reach. That card was a huge factor in the standard format it was legal in. And in the kind of cubes where you would slot Delirium in if you're really about combat, it's this end game, like late mid game early end game card that can really gum up the battlefield there's a lot of tension about getting to delirium and being ready when it's time and then planning on trying to attack through it or trying to win with it like actually close the game because it's a three five 
you know, it's not tremendous at attacking. I actually love the gameplay of Delirium broadly and Ishkana specifically mm -hmm. as an end game kind of card for Cube. I, I completely agree. I love I love Ishkana, and I I completely agree on uh, on Delirium. And honestly, this really goes to show that the the design from a mechanics perspective that was put into Shadows Over Innistrad and Eldritch Moon, because the two, I think the two like superstar mechanics to come out of those sets respectively were Investigate and Delirium. And uh, we just talked about Modern Horizons 2. And I would say that those two mechanics are like the, these for the front and center mechanics that they returned with new cards for that set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not surprising to see them return to those. Investigate specifically. I'm curious to see what we get for some white cards that can generate card advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear me talk about Thraven Inspector a lot, and I do think that there's a lot of ground for white to draw cards. Investigate just actually feels like a white way to gain access to that. There's, of course, other ways to generate card advantage, but Thraven Inspector, I think, is inarguably just a home run design for white. Yeah, I completely agree. I hope they actually just reprint Thraven Inspector for this set. Yeah, but with a different name. Oh, so you just have two? Yeah. yeah. I'd be down for that. I'd play two. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's a great card. Uh, so when you are, when you're making, uh, let's say you're making an Innistrad set cube or Innistrad plane cube. So you're obviously including cards from Innistrad, Dark Ascension, Avacyn Restored, Shadows of Innistrad, and Eldritch Moon. Would you include cards that clearly take place on the plane of Innistrad but are not from one of those five sets? Yeah, so the pool you'd be digging from there would be things like core sets or commander decks, some of the supplemental products where you'll see a character from that plane reference in the flavor text or the art. Or even just where some of these products maybe just take place on that plane. You know, now there's going to be a commander product released simultaneously with these Innistrad sets, right? Mm hmm. And so exactly you have to right. ask yourself if you want to put those in. I have a friend who is pretty serious of Vorthos. He recently took it apart, but for some years he maintained a Ravnica plane cube. And he was really in the weeds on there being a brainstorm that had jace when he was on ravnica flavor text or something like that yeah. so like brainstorm was in the cube even though it generally wasn't very good because there's not really ways to shuffle your deck there's only a couple odd cards but yeah it's still something you could put in and i think that when it comes to limiting yourself to a small number of sets i think that the reason a lot of people do it is because it's just an easier environment to manage you know certainly there's nostalgic motivation but that design restriction is going to allow you to really focus and get something done where looking at the entire history of magic is really exhausting. There's just That's so true. the pool is gigantic, especially if you're a newer player. Even if you've been playing for like five years, which is a long time, there's still so many cards that came out before you maybe even ever heard of the game, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so you, you will expand the mechanical diversity. Maybe there's some interesting one off cards. I am a proponent of trying to just widen the legal card pool for cubes. I like that. I like mixing things and adding mm -hmm. to the depth that way. So for me, it makes sense. But there's certainly nothing wrong with keeping and even just doing the set cube thing where you take three of every common, two of every uncommon, one of every rare and mythic and shuffle that together maybe even collate that so it just feels like booster draft that it, i mean i love innistrad yeah so I'd i'm, I'm not against that, that. <laughs> no no i'd totally be down for that definitely i think that you know this set innistrad initially in this plane was devised as top down as we've said a couple of times so it seems a little backwards to me to say all right well these other cards are like mechanically relevant or set on this plane but i don't want to include them because they're not technically that's like, well, if you're if you're creating a cube around like top down design, it would seem weird to like exclude cards on purpose. Now, it, I, I do think that there's a lot of, of relevancy in saying 
Uh, it's a lot more upkeep when you have to like, let's look through every magic set ever to see if there's Innistrad related cards on it. I would say uh, you obviously have to start with those five core sets, but as you as you notice cards, don't be resistant to including them if it fits the theme, even if they don't have one of those five set symbols. on mm -hmm. And it's kind to of, it's kind of ride land. take that even more extreme in the other direction, Spooky Cube is heavily influenced by Innistrad, but I include cards. So there's just no reason that I wouldn't include a card outside of maybe some aesthetic disqualification where it's like, yeah, this person looks a little too happy. You know, they, they, they wouldn't be in, in this kind of environment. But um, <laughs> yeah, the cube ends up with a lot of cards from Innistrad, but it's also really taking a lot from Odyssey block. There's a ton of stuff for Graveyard going on there. Madness, the mechanic originally featured in Odyssey. Fiery Temper was reprinted in Shadows. Very cool card in that environment, but it's originally from Odyssey block. Yep. And just Madness as a mechanic from there. Threshold is a nice Graveyard mechanic. It's like it's kind of a goofy mechanic, but it's not that difficult to understand, especially if you've been playing with it for a long time. I mean, Threshold is the, is the, is the true precursor to Delirium. Yeah, very similar. Like the things you try to do to hit Delirium are basically the same thing as you do to hit Threshold. Yes. So it just really works mechanically together very well. And I didn't just stop, but I think it's also totally reasonable to do something where you take two different blocks or planes. You say, okay, well, this is my Innistrad and Odyssey cube, for example. Do like a, a mashup kind of thing there. But that would actually be, that would actually be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like that that combination specifically would be cool. Yeah, there's this. I don't know. This is why cubes are great because you could do a million things, and it's like you've sold me on this idea after just thinking about it for three seconds. Yeah, you would basically use in. you'd use like three red cards from Odyssey because there's all the discarded random and just the Innistrad stuff is uh, is more compelling. But there's a pretty deep well of cool and compelling cards from Odyssey. Otherwise. <sighs> All right, we are uh, about an hour into this podcast and uh, we have a, a spicy section coming up. So anything else you want to talk about for Innistrad set cubes in general? Uh, I mean, there's, there's no wrong way to cube. I think that our answers and our preferences to these questions, what sets do you include, what cards do you include, are less to take on than just asking the question yourself. Whatever you think the answer is, you're right. But I recommend being open to something maybe a little broader than you initially considered. And I really do think there's a lot of value to drawing from Odyssey Block specifically if you're working on Innistrad mechanics. Just like you said, Threshold Delirium, they go hand in hand so well. And uh, Magic has a deep, rich history, which does make it kind of daunting. But also when you find the right things, it's incredibly cool. Yeah, it's a very rewarding experience to come across a card you didn't know existed and it's the perfect card for what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of fun. So, yeah, like Ryan said, fully agree. There's no wrong way to cube. Ask yourself the questions. Don't just listen to us. You know, I'm, po I'm posing these because, you know, we're trying to get the discussion going and maybe you agree with this, maybe you don't. And that is always totally fine uh, as long as you are doing the thing that makes the most sense for your cube design. Exactly. All right, so we're going to take a uh, one last break and we're going to come back. And Ryan and I are each going to count down our top five Innistrad plane cards for cubes. Hello there from Dominario's Judgment, a weekly podcast for Star City Games with me, Dom Harvey. And me, Ari Lex. Where we bring you the latest, greatest, and downright weirdest things Modern has to offer. Want to know what to expect for next weekend's events? We've got you covered. Do you want deep breakdowns of the hot topics and decks in modern? We've got you covered. Just want to make sure you don't miss the latest nonsense before your opponents teach you a lesson about it in the queues? Oh yeah, we have definitely got you covered. And when Modern Horizons 2 blows the ceiling off this format, as it surely will, we'll be here with you to pick up the pieces. Find us every week on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Or if you want to head over to StarCityGames.com, we'll be right there alongside all the great content from all your other favorite content producers. All right, Ryan. We have each selected 
cards from the five Innistrad sets, which as a as a recap, that's Innistrad, Dark Ascension, Avacyn Restored, which counts, <laughs> Shadows Over Innistrad, and Eldritch Moon to create a list for our top five Innistrad cards for cubes in general. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I have no idea what's on your list. You have no idea what's on my list. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to see what you came up with. I went through just a quick scryfall search. I kind of typed out what I thought were interesting options. My list of honorable mentions is pretty lengthy. I'd, I would be pleasantly surprised if you had something on your list that was not among my honorable mentions. But okay. I do have my five anyway. Okay, fair enough. Uh, well, you, if you have, you have your list of honorable mentions, how about we do this? Why don't we go five to one, and then afterwards you name off a couple of your honorable mentions that were not named in the list. Okay, that sounds good to me. Okay. So if you want to start with five, we'll go five, your five, my five, your four, my four, so on. Mm-hmm. And then after my one, you can read the rest of your honorable mentions. Perfect. All right, so I largely went with just kind of across all cubes. My number five is one that is even on Arena. It is from original Innistrad block. Actually, a, a hit from Dark Ascension is Hellrider. There is mm. kind of a long list of fours that go in and out of cubes. Personal favorite of mine is Koth of the Hammer. Chanda Torch of Defiance makes a pretty strong claim to being the best. P and Kieran Alar are also really interesting. But Hellrider still very much is not getting crowded out from any cube lists. If you're picking something else, it's because you're supporting a theme. This is definitely one of the best red fours in cube history. And it does this awesome thing where it's a really exciting card because the ceiling for the damage it can do is just through the roof. Yeah, how many creatures do you have? That's how much damage this card is worth. And then there's the question of if you can keep it around for a turn, then it's just even more damage, probably closes the game at that point. It has haste, three, three body is totally serviceable. It's just a card that just is pretty beatable, honestly. Like it's not overwhelming, but it still feels really powerful and it's still really cool and fun to play with after all these years. I'm so glad that you had Hellrider at five because I was deciding of my last card, my fifth card, and that would have been number six. Nice. So I, Hellrider's not on my list, but I absolutely love that card, and it's like barely not it. Uh, Hellrider is, it's, it's got a card such a beating in the best way possible. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, my number five is Liliana the Last Hope from Eldritch Moon. Uh, I believe, and this is going to be a bold claim, I'm going to go ahead and start saying these early. Uh, I believe Liliana the Last Hope is the best Liliana for cubes in general. I mean, that's I think, just, just a fact. I mean, I, look, you might agree <laughs> with me, Ryan. I know for sure there's going to be a lot of people that do not agree with that statement. Uh, but I think that this Liliana, three mana Planeswalker, starts with three loyalty, uh, has three relevant modes, a literal game ending mode, but something that is not oppressive if you're just doing the nuts and bolts of plusing and minusing um, is something that is, is, is fun to interact with in, uh, on the board because it's not, in most cases, there are definitely times that you can just cold your whole opponent's board with Liliana if they have a lot of one toughness creatures. Um, but I really like this card because I, the thing that is, one of my favorite things about this card is the minus two because it really, that's something that really rewards deck building. We were talking about like filling your graveyard up and a lot of people, you know, look at that card and it's like, all right, if I already have something in there, then uh, I will make sure to be able to get something back. So I don't have to worry about if I miss, but if you're playing something that's like more graveyard focused, like a cube that's more graveyard focused, uh, Liliana being like a minus two to mill two cards and then just draw a card out of your graveyard and you're, if you know you're going to hit like a high percentage of the time or put something in there that you just want to fill your graveyard up, this card is just excellent. And I think it does that better than a different Liliana that just puts a card from your hand into your graveyard, even though 
in a vacuum, that card might be more powerful. I think this is the this is my favorite Liliana for cubes. Yeah, well, this, this this Liliana actually just generates value, and if you are plussing and actually killing things, like you said, it's just a beating. You can just run away with the game that way. The minus two, either if a game is close or just being a thing you can do that is fine if you need to catch up a little bit. Especially if we're talking about like an Innistrad plane cube and you're trying to make an Ishkana go off. That's really yeah. powerful. And then despite being generally a planeswalker that's good in creature matchups, you have an ultimate that just beats control decks. And yes. it's, it's all on its three mana planeswalker. Yeah, the card's just incredible. One of my favorite things about this Liliana is so you're like, this card is great if you're ahead. What, I've had multiple moments with Liliana where it's like, okay, I need to play this. I need to minus two. I need to hit something right now. And those moments where there's tension, and then if it if it if you pull it off and you like you mill a thing and then are able to get it back that you wouldn't have had previously, those are just great cube moments, and that's what cube's about. So yep. this card provides that. Definitely. All right. My number four is collective brutality. This this card really just fits any environment where you would think about putting it in, because either Giving a creature minus two, minus two is a serviceable removal spell. Looking at your opponent's hand, trying to get a counter spell or maybe some other instant of sorcery that'd be a problem for you. That's a big deal. Against aggressive decks, sometimes you do just want to gain life. Against red decks, all of the escalate modes just matter. And <laughs> they matter whether you're converting a card that otherwise is low value. For example, discarding a land that you don't really have use for the mana. Or this card is just like the nut in Reanimator. This card is just such a big deal for Reanimator decks when it was first printed. And it's still, I think, just a really high pick for those kinds of strategies that also just plays in black decks. Uh, I've had I've had Collective Brutality in my main cube since it's been printed. And I mean it's just it's just a great card. Yeah. But you 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 hit all the you hit all the relevant all the relevant bits. Uh it it does definitely the thing I actually don't like about it in cube is when you are playing against a mono red deck because it seems almost unfair that you can have a single card that normally you're like losing some sort of card advantage. But when you when you like escalate it twice against the red deck, you feel like you're actually gaining. And that generally shouldn't happen with that card. <laughs> uh, but I mean, like, so be it, I guess. Yeah. And some people really like getting one over on red decks. <laughs> yeah, so, I guess. Uh, that's value in some circles. Uh that's fair. That's fair. I, I love I love correct collective reality. Okay. Uh my number four card uh is the our third black card in a row, and that's Blood Artist. Nice. Uh this is the I mean, really while it might not be the first uh aristocrats type thing. Well, I guess it is the first aristocrats type thing. Where, where this is one of the cards that was in the the primary deck that, that uh, bore that name. Um, but this is really like the grandfather of the sacrifice theme for a lot of cubes. Uh, it's incredibly efficient. It's incredibly fragile. Uh, and that's what makes it great because it's sitting on the battlefield. It's an 0-1 and there's so many games where you can just take over the game by just having a million blood artist triggers. I love tokens. I love sacrificing things. I love blood artist. Uh, and this is absolutely one of my favorite cube cards just in general. Uh, and it's definitely one of the best ones from Epstrad. I should have guessed that that was on your list. That's oh, not yeah, surprising at all. <laughs> no, no, no. That, was a, that was, should have been a layup for sure. <laughs> all right. My number three is Tigerless Tracker. This kind of just like is the green card. And the more time passes, it doesn't get crowded out. It solidifies its position. It's this mid-range card advantage beater that just gets huge that can hang with your recent design philosophy, like your modern cube or just something from maybe a lower power level. It still fits there because you're you could probably about attrition removal spells that is just still awesome to play in Vintage Cube. Just scales so well with the environment, generates a lot of value, albeit at a cost, tends to be either you're playing a cube that really is about that card advantage and you have the time to do it, 
or in Vintage Cube or Legacy Cube, your green deck generates enough mana that you can actually just convert those cards and still cast your spells. Tireless Tracker is just a house. Well, you will be excited to hear, Ryan, that my number three card is also Tireless Tracker. <laughs> nice. Uh, this is... There's some justice for the greatest landfall creature of all time to be from Innistrad and not Zendikar. <laughs> um, but I absolutely love Tireless Tracker. I think it is probably my favorite green creature of all time. Um, it's It's just an exceptional card in in essentially every cube uh that you can fit it in and like like ryan said it scales extremely well and uh especially if, even for lower powered cubes when you're not able maybe if you're not playing fetch lands uh you're able to like scale back some of its power and just make it a, gen a generically good card and not have to be like a super power card where you have to or where you have the ability to really like speed up the the enter the battlefield process to make those clues so this is just a card that I love a, a lot like Blood Artist, like at every different stage of cubes. And I think it really fits in, in so many of them that, it, yeah, absolutely in my top five ranks is my number three, too. And my number two is one that maybe it would be really easy to read me for. But it's the best white card yet printed. It's Thraben Inspector. Yeah. Just for white aggressive decks, the most important thing, getting on the battlefield. And then if you are a more particular deck, if you're sporting a different theme, good creature to blink, replaces itself with the clue, fine creature to sacrifice if that's what you're getting up to. It just really does it all. And in, in that aggressive role, just for generically good, like again, for those decks, you really do just need to be doing something on turn one. So it's going to increase your volume for that. And then for those decks, just spending that mana to draw an extra card, that's great too. Uh, if you if you want to have the position that the one two is not worth much, well, you're wrong because there's a number <laughs> of one like x like one toughness creatures running around where that matters. The two toughness yeah. can make blocking situations really awkward for your opponent. And just having that body, if you are trying to hook up an equipment, if you're trying to transform your legions landing, if you're trying to play an anthem, th this card really just is incredible. And I think that maybe people think that I'm being facetious when I refer to the card often as the best white card yet printed and on some level i am but i do sincerely mean that this card is excellent uh you'll get you'll get no objection from me this is a pro thraven inspector podcast and i will say that a something i often mention about cube it's becoming slightly less true now than it was a few years ago because uh power creep for creatures is is accelerating a lot faster but at the time this card was printed uh, there was a massive, massive discrepancy of creatures in cube from a power to toughness ratio. Creatures just had a much higher power than toughness. So having a creature that has one power that provides some sort of card advantage as, as well as another game object was meaningful. For the exact same reasons that we talked about Lily on the last hope being good, Tyler's Tracker is good for a lot of the same reasons because it is matching up with a lot of those other things. Uh, and let me tell you, nothing wants to trade with the tireless tracker, but a lot of things do. A Thraven Inspector, but yeah. Or sorry, it was, sorry. Thraven Everything Inspector, yes. wants to trade with tireless tracker. Tireless tracker, yeah, yeah. No, nothing wants to trade with a Thraven Inspector, but every, a lot of things do. Yeah. Okay, uh, my number two card. Um, you know, this is uh, without a doubt the most powerful card on my list. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't add it uh, because it is. I think when you have a greatest of all time, it has to make the list. And Snapcaster Mage is without a doubt one of the greatest blue cards in the history of Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one that certainly is on the higher power level. So less powerful cubes, even though someone could make an argument, well, you're flashing back less powerful cards, so the card is worse. I would say the opposite. I would say the fact that you don't have the opportunity to do this. And the fact that you get to flashback cards, regardless of the power level, makes it incredibly powerful. Uh, but Snapcaster Mage obviously has made, you know, is a staple of every format it's ever been legal in in the history of Magic. Uh, so it's not my number one card. It's my number two. And, and really just out of respect for just how incredibly versatile and powerful this card is. Uh, and I, I truly believe it is, 
I mean, it's it's definitely one of the greatest blue cards of all time, and and arguably the best color in Magic. Yeah, I like I like what you said. One of the greatest of all times. Uh, blue tends to be the best color. This card scales with environments, except it scales in a way where it's at the top of all of them. <laughs> yes, it's, it's another copy of whatever the best thing to do at the time is, and then also the floor. This doesn't involve you needing to even have a spell. Sometimes if you have one, that's gravy, but just flashing in the 2-1 and trading some creature, protecting a planeswalker, attacking a planeswalker, getting on the battlefield for some other reason because you're a little choked on mana. The uh, Snapcaster Mage is an incredible card, and it actually is my number one. Okay. Okay. So that is your number one. Uh, I'm going to tell you what my number one is, and it's a, it's a card we've mentioned on this podcast today. Uh, and I think the reason this is a number one over Snapcaster Mage is because I believe this is a ubiquitous cube card and a ubiquitous Innistrad card. Uh, and that's can I, can I, oh, I was going to ask I'm if sorry. I could guess that it was Lingering Souls, but it, yeah. It, it, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I, sorry. I cut you off right before. It is Lingering Souls. That is my number one card. It is, uh, I, in my opinion, this is the de facto like black-white card for all cubes. Uh, even though it's it's an uncommon, so you're in, in your common uncommon cubes, this is going to make it in pretty much all of those. This is a great card for power level because even though it's an incredibly powerful card, it's not too powerful to be oppressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and even in the highest power level cubes, this is still a card that provides exceptional value, especially when you are in a position, you know, you have a collective brutality, you're discarding it, and then you can flash it black, flash it back. Uh, for one in the black and and not have to cast it the first time. I, I mean, everyone knows why Lingering Souls is great. Right? I don't I feel like I have to defend this card, but uh, I think this is literally the quintessential cube card of every single card that's ever been printed in Estrada. And we have talked about a lot of great cards. Lingering Souls was my card on the outside looking in. Yeah. And your point that it just shows up in every cube, that's just a fact. I, I can't argue with that. I can only offer a why that was less compelling for me. And that's because unlike Snapcaster Mage, Lingering Souls is going to be one of the better cards in your, your Peasant Cube, going to be one of the better cards when you're lower power level cubes. It's still going to show up in Legacy Vintage, but it's actually more towards the bottom of the cube there, uh, at least for my money. And it still shows up though, which is yeah, plenty of reason yeah. to, to respect it. Absolutely. Well, that's pretty good. I predicted that we were going to have two crossovers and that was exactly true. Nice. We had uh, Tireless Tracker and Snapcaster Mage Star Crossovers. Yeah, and everything that you named was on my honorable mentions list. Okay. Uh, good, good. I'm surprised that uh, you, didn't hot, you didn't have Liliana of the Veil on your honorable mentions list. Uh, Liliana of the Veil is definitely... I have Liliana of the Veil on my list with the question mark because as soon as I wrote it down, I knew it wasn't going to make my top five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is, I think it's one that's worth mentioning as an artifact of its time. But I think when it came out, it was just like, man, how how are you going to beat this card? If you have yeah. any follow up to your Liliana, that's just absurd. But some time passes. Your opponent might not have a creature to sacrifice. They might have some dumpy creature. They might have a Thraven Inspector. So the minus twos are just really not effective against them. You know, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's the just printing really of Thraven strong. Inspector really put the, uh, the nail <laughs> yeah, in the coffin. Yeah, that, that was it. That was it. <laughs> it provides you the creature to sacrifice. And then when you discard a card, you're just going to draw back with Thraven Inspector. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a ton of game. This is actually, I mean, this, this is a story about modern, but similar things happen in cube the reason it doesn't happen i don't have a cube story is because the card's not really good enough to be played even in a lot of the cubes it shows up in anymore so i i, I don't play against Liliana of the veil vale really in cube anymore but when i play prowess and modern which yeah, it, it's it's been a number of months but my opponent is playing Liliana of the veil vale deck it's very common that I, even if i have the means to kill it i let them activate it because the card in their hand because they're trying to cast four or more mana spells is more valuable than the card in my hand. <laughs> like the yeah. plus one is just actively bad in some matchups and the minus two ain't what it used to be. The card is still totally fine, but I completely agree that it's worse than Liliana the Last Hope, just kind of just in cubes broadly. Yeah, I think so too. I also think it's just less 
it's less interesting. I really like Liliana of the Veil still. I mean, it's like a it's like a historically relevant card. I think when, that when if you are going to build like an Innistrad plane or block cube, having Liliana of the Veil versus Geist of Stained Craft is probably like a must. But <laughs> yeah. that's just like not the games that you play in other environments. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, you know, when this card was printed, this was in the conversation of one of the best Planeswalkers of all time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to feel like you, you, you know, it, it, it's earned respect, even though uh, time has passed more. So magic has changed in a way to where the things that it's good against are, it's not that they're less relevant, but most everything has a way of mitigating it. Yeah. Um, you were talking earlier about how a lot of magic is just, you're, you're free rolling a ton of card advantage. It's kind of yeah. trivial to have cards left over in your hand. And drawing extra cards has always been more powerful than making your opponent discard cards, just categorically. Mm -hmm. And it, it just takes a more powerful discard engine to be better than an opponent trying to draw cards. Like, you, you have to have a card that makes an opponent discard that is just so much better because it's a weaker category. So you have to be playing things like Mind Twist and Thought Seize to really get interested in making your opponent discard cards. And then drawing cards, just like they will still be competitive with even some of the best ones. If you just have just multiple cards that draw multiple cards, you'll just catch up with the discard cards incidentally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it just makes it more difficult because so many things provide either direct card advantage or, or sideways card advantage that, uh, yeah, that's, I don't want to say that's a relic of the past because I think that, that, that Lily on the Veil is still a very much a cube playable card uh you know but there's a new liliana in town and she's pretty dope yeah so. liliana the veil certainly makes sense if you have reanimator in the spread both as a card you can play against a reanimator deck because they will often have one creature and so the edict is good and then if you are playing reanimator pretty dang good discard outlet yeah yeah but like the card you want to discard cards for value like that that's actually one of the things i find more inviting about Liliana of the Veil, which, if that's what I'm excited about, that's kind of an indictment of the card in its own right. Yeah, there you go. I mean, that's appropriate. Uh, okay, any other awesome Anastrod cards for Cube that we want to talk about before we wrap it up today? We've mentioned Crypt Breaker and Grave Crawler, and yes. those ones are getting better with Midnight Hunt dropping. There's going to yeah, be more zombie stuff. So I would say they're getting a lot better. Yeah, keep an eye on those ones. I don't think we talked about Huntmaster of the Fells by name at all, but that's a classic. It is a classic. It is a classic. I like Huntmaster. Um, I it's it is the best of the the transform cards, and I think that mechanic is still mostly bad. Uh, that card obviously is quite powerful, so it's like worth the hoops, but. I like it. I would probably put that on my honorable mentions because uh, I think that's been a quintessential cube card since it's been out too. But yeah, I expect yeah. a lot of people have Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, in their top fives. I super don't. For yeah, mine. I'm. I think I'm colder on that card than maybe everyone. Yeah, I'm also pretty cold. On I I do think that Thalia, Heretic, Cathar was within arm's reach of making my list you know i i wouldn't I, I i don't think it could have made my top five i think that it's likely to make my top 10 okay that's fair that's fair yeah um i don't know i don't i, don't, I think i think we have covered most of the the rela i think okay now there's one more i think uh i'll put it on an honorable mention that's uh restoration yeah I mean, yeah. if you want to talk, so uh, I, I stopped typing at Avison Restored Cards because it's not a real set and it never happened. But <laughs> you, you got to also acknowledge Gristlebrand and Crater of Behemoth. Yeah, you definitely do. Uh, I mean, they are they are game enders. I think they are very powerful uh, with overall not great designs. But... <laughs> uh, there definitely have been cube staples in a long time for a lot of cubes. Mm -hmm. And I've had them in my cubes for, for, for several years. I don't currently right now, uh, but that is not because they're not good enough. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. There's just one more card I want to shout out in honorable mentions. And okay. I, I think that if we were doing a weighted grade by how much they added to their respective colors, this could be a claim to number one. Ooh. And that's Nahiri the Harbinger. This is a Boros card that gives you a reason to do something other than attack and block. And it's actually really compelling for red, white X control, usually Jeskai. But this is a threat, you know, that, that ultimate, there's probably something in your deck, even if it's just Inferno Titan or even something like a Thrag Tusk. You know, the, the bar's not really high for that minus eight having a pretty impactful ability. The minus two will often answer something, be it a mana rock or a creature that could be a thorn in your side. And then you're just filtering your draws otherwise. This is probably the most compelling red-white card for a cube that doesn't go on aggressive decks and it still can totally hang in vintage cube now by virtue of being boros it's not super sought after but a boros card that can hang in vintage cube that's a big deal yeah uh i i don't think it's crazy to say it's the most singularly unique white red card in magic yeah it, it, it does something w- entirely different than largely any other red-white card, which is kind of in, in, in its own sphere for some sort of aggression, uh, w- you know, whether it be direct damage or, or efficient creatures or some combination of that. And Nahiri is just off in her own world doing something entirely different. And there's definitely something to be said for that. I don't think it would make my list, but I absolutely agree that it is, it is worth a mention because of uh it's design it's playability and it's i mean honestly it's like a factor for kind of sticking around as a playable card especially because right essentially right after shadows and eldritch moon um you know like a year after that the magic design started changing pretty significantly and this card has still had a foothold yep yeah yeah good 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 note on that ryan I think that's it. I think those are all the ones we have then. Yeah, that, that, that's it for the most compelling honorable mentions. No reason to name yeah. literally every playable every card. card. There's a yeah, lot. We'd be, here, we'd be here for another hour. The set's sweet. I mean, the, the block yes. is sweet. The plane is sweet. Really excited to go back. Yes. Uh, speaking of which, we will be back for the next several weeks talking about Innistrad and Hunt. We're going to try to break down every card that we feel like is cubable at all for this set. Uh, if you are familiar with how we've done that, it's going to be very similar in the past. Of course, we're always still learning and growing of of the best way to do our uh, set reviews. So we'll probably you know change a thing or two here or there, but uh, we're going to try to be as comprehensive as possible because we know people have really appreciated that. So look forward to that for the next couple of weeks. All right. Thank you all very much for listening. Uh, as a reminder, please subscribe to the 540 uh, on anywhere you are listening to this podcast, like Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, Amazon, Stitcher, YouTube, your local podcast app, pretty much anywhere you can. Uh, leave us a review if you are able. That always is very helpful for the algorithm and is a hungry beast. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of creature type it would be on Innistrad, <laughs> but rest assured, it would be a horrifying. Yeah, thing. I don't think that they're doing Eldrazi anymore, but that, uh, <laughs> that's the probably closest it. analog. Yeah. Uh, if you, uh, <laughs> again, if you can, you know, we always appreciate reviews and just, and not just reviews, but also just spreading the word. Uh, you know, we, we've, we have a lot of people that, that, that contact us on Twitter. Um, and the more that, of course, you talk about the 540 with your friends, uh, will help this podcast continue to exist and grow in the form that it is, which is something I think all of us want, especially if you're listening to the podcast at this point, you're committed. Mm-hmm. We appreciate that. Uh, speaking of Twitter, if you want to reach out to us, you can hit me up at jparnell1 over there. Uh, I respond to pretty much everything I'm tagged in. I'm not quite as active as Ryan is on Twitter, but if you if you at me, I will get at you. If you want to listen to my other podcast, that's Think Twice MTG. You can find on any of the aforementioned places you can find podcasts. And of course, Commander Versus on StarCityGames.com and YouTube every week. Ryan, what about you? You can find me on Twitter at Ryan Overdrive. Often respond to being tagged. 
as Justin said, I'm a bit more active. You can also find things like today I tweeted that I started brewing a batch of pumpkin spice beer. So, you know, that's probably the best thing happening in my life right now. So you can get updates of thrilling things like that. And you can find my articles on StarCityGames.com. Um, I should have something up by the time you hear this about Tinkerer's Cube. Not sure what's going on with that. And then I should have my <laughs> top 10 Innistrad Midnight Hunt Cube cards coming up soon. That, that's my plan anyway. But uh, you can find the updates on that cube relevant stuff, uh, broadly irrelevant stuff on my Twitter at Ryan Overdrive and my articles on StarCityGames.com. I'm here for it. And all of you can be as well. Make sure to check out that. Obviously, uh, you're going to hear about us going in, in depth on all of these cards, but Ryan's article will, will come out in between some of these podcasts if you're really looking for the, uh, the heavy hitters to add to your cube as soon as possible. Exactly. All right, that is it for this week. Thank you all very much for listening. We'll be back next time with Mr. Midnight Hunt. Catch you then.